Yosemite, a world-famous national park filled with astounding granite walls, amazing waterfalls, creeks and rivers, and giant sequoia groves. Just 61 miles from Fresno, California, the national park spans 747,956 acres throughout the Sierra National Forest, and each acre is filled with rich history. Approximately 4 million people are drawn to the park each year, with around 5,000 to 6,000 cars entering per day during the summer. This national park keeps people coming back because of its unique landscape and huge national monuments. Famous cliffs such as El Capitan and Half Dome only showcase a tiny portion of the park, yet they are two of the main tourist attractions. In addition to the stunning visuals, Yosemite offers over 800 miles of hiking trails, world famous rock climbing routes, white water rafting, biking, and various winter activities, which keeps the adventure seekers coming back as well. Yosemite was first discovered by Lafayette Houghton Bunnell, who was a member of the Mariposa Battalion. When the group rode out in 1851 in search of tribal leaders responsible for the recent raids inflicted on American settlements, they discovered Yosemite Valley. Yosemite remained an untouched tribal land for over 13 years following the discovery. June 30, 1864, President Abraham Lincoln signed Senate Bill 203, better known as the Yosemite Valley Grant Act. This new legislation granted Yosemite Valley and the closely neighboring Mariposa Big Tree Grove to the state of California under the stipulation that they would be preserved for public use, resort, and recreation. The rest of the land within the current park borders was declared a national park in 1890, but the valley itself remained under California legislation until 1906. There was much debate about the balance between preservation and public use during the grant in 1864. Conservationist Frederick Law Olmsted provided warnings about overuse of the park and destruction if preservation was not taken seriously. 26 years later, the all-famous naturalist John Muir inspired public support for all of Yosemite to be taken back under federal control in order to properly preserve the land and in 1906, Yosemite Valley was finally joined with the rest of the park under federal legislation as a declared national park. On May 15, 1903, the park got a very important visitor. While on his grand tour of 25 states in eight weeks, President Theodore Roosevelt made a stop in Yosemite National Park. Accompanied by John Muir, the two decided to camp for three nights out in the open air. The first night they spent under a grizzly giant tree in the Mariposa Grove of giant sequoias, then atop a snowy mountain near Sentinel Dome, and the last in a meadow near the base of Bridal Veil Falls. The two men talked for hours about the importance of preserving nature as it is so that generations to follow would be able to experience it in the same way that they were. Theodore Roosevelt and John Muir marveled at the beauty of Yosemite. Their passion and love for the area led Roosevelt to expand the federal protection of Yosemite and the national park system and sign into existence five new national parks, 18 national monuments, 55 national bird sanctuaries and wildlife refuges, and 150 national forests, which, like Yosemite, would all be protected under federal law. Before there was any discussion regarding the national park system, Many Native American tribes inhabited and thrived off the land. We spoke with Nika Dondero, who was a direct descendant of the Paiute tribe. Nika says, my tribe and ancestors were born and raised in Yosemite Valley. Back then there was salmon in the river, so they would fish and hunt. And um, the women would do a lot of basket making, like and um, gathering and pine nut picking and cerebrary picking. And they would, they were really traditional. That's how they lived. Kids were, um, they got to play a lot too, but they, they were like workers at a very young age. They would have to work with their, with the men and go get wood and go gather and things like that. They would meet other Paiutes from Bishop and Mono Lake and they would um, do trading. So a lot of trading baskets, beadwork, um, bows, arrows, Things that the moccasins, you know, headdresses, beadwork, regalia. So they would trade a lot with the other Paiutes um, in, in Mona Lake. 
Oh, yeah, my grandpa grew, grew up in Yosemite. He was born and raised there. My dad and his brothers and sisters. So a lot of them grew up and were raised in Yosemite Valley. Uh, my great aunties and uncles, you know, they were all famous basket makers. Um, they're, they're famous for all their basketry. They're in Washington, D.C. You'll see some of their baskets in Yosemite Valley still, like showcased in the big museums and in these big, huge, like glass platforms. So there's there's a lot of history still there. A lot of my family's baskets are still there. Probably like 90% of, of my bloodline is still, still like presented in the museum. Even though they're gone, you know, their, their work, their beadwork, their basketry is still, is still there very much alive. The California gold rush in 1849 brought thousands of non-Indian people to the waterways of the Sierra Nevada mountains. These ruthless miners killed members of the native tribes, including Paiutes, or forced them into starvation. In 1851, when the Mariposa Battalion entered with the intentions of removing the native people from the Yosemite area, they weren't very successful but definitely worried members of the Paiutes and neighboring tribes about the future of their home. As more and more non-natives began to settle in the park, tribes began to adopt the ways of the Euro-American, including their clothing, jobs, and food options. After 1900, the number of natives in Yosemite drastically diminished as the housing cost got too much, gaining employment got too difficult, and the constant push to leave their home was a lot to take on. Now they're still fighting for federally recognized uh, recognition. By fighting for federal recognition, it will ensure that the Paiute tribe, along with the neighboring tribes of Yosemite, would be able to gain trust on the land that was once their home, and they are able to receive federal benefits as well as protection. This recognition would also give them, to an extent, some power of self-government. We spoke with Emily Dayhoff, who has been working in the park for nine years as a park ranger and cultural demonstrator. Emily is from the Southern Sierra Miwok tribe, which presently resides mostly in Mariposa, California. In our interview, Emily mentioned how she finds value in sharing a story that has been misconstrued with people from all over the world. She finds value in breaking down the stereotypes around Yosemite's history and shedding light on the Native American tribes who lived off the land before it became a national park. When asked how the Yosemite Museum encapsulates the park's rich history, Emily explained that it all points back to the baskets. In the 1910s, the Park Service held an event called Yosemite Indian Field Days, which aimed to revitalize the culture and promote tourism. Basket makers amped up the intricacies of their baskets for this event in hopes of selling them, which created a whole new style of baskets. So in a way, tourism helped to drive forward the evolution of basketry within the Native American communities in Yosemite National Park. In terms of preservation, it can be challenging to preserve such a massive land that 4 million humans roam across each year. Because of this, Yosemite has an ecological restoration program. The program serves to maintain the integrity of the park's ecosystem and restore the natural balance of the park. According to the Yosemite National Park Service website, Yosemite has completed a wide variety of ecological restoration projects throughout the park over the past 20 years. Several projects are underway in the park and include different park ecosystems, such as meadows, invasive plants, social trails, riparian areas, and wetlands. These projects are designed to protect the ecosystem while still providing visitor access and enjoyment. Some projects that are currently underway include meadow, forest, and river restoration. Akerson Meadow was experiencing severe erosion damages, and so after the restoration, the whole meadow will be back to its preferred form. Additionally, the park is working to restore forests to a more natural state. A healthy forest is vital for preservation practices because it helps to reduce the risk and spread of potential wildfire damage. One more area that is currently undergoing restoration is a river near the North Pines campground area, which is being restored to plant willows. These restorations require funding, research, and great planning, which shows that Yosemite values preservation and will continue to work towards restoration projects in the future. And it is because of Yosemite's conservation practices that visitors are able to keep enjoying the beautiful landscapes and all that the park has to offer, which is exactly why those 4 million people are attracted each year. For more information regarding Yosemite's restoration projects, visit the Yosemite National Park Service website. If you haven't already, 
we encourage you to take a trip to Yosemite National Park to experience one of the most famous landscapes in the world. While enjoying your time there, though, we hope you'll be reminded of the historical context within the park. While everybody should get a chance to visit Yosemite, it is important that we respect the land and its history.